NanoHub U online instruction. Welcome back. I'm Professor Rickus. In this lecture, we're going to be considering the cell as a living machine. So, as I said, cells are the fundamental unit of life, but we can also view them as a living machine. And our view or concepts and how we interact with cells may change a little bit when we consider this framework. So in this lecture, we'll particularly look at some quantification of what the power consumption of cells are. We'll take a closer look at energy input, conversion, storage, and utilization and look a little deeper into energy utilization. What is the work of cells? So let's look at sort of a common definition of a machine. So Merriam-Webster tells us that a machine is a piece of equipment with moving parts that does work when it's given power. So what defines living? Now the definition of life or living is actually quite challenging and there's many ways to go about it. But let's just look at the Merriam-Webster definition. And this says an, or an organismic state characterized by capacity for metabolism, growth, reaction to stimuli, and reproduction. And so this is very typically how we study and top machines in engineering and how we study cells in biology. But it turns out that there's a lot more in common between these two definitions than what might appear on the surface. And that's our goal in this lecture, is to start to view cells as a living machine. So let's think about what the basic job of the cell to do. At the most fundamental level for most cells, it's to make more cells. So it has to make the building blocks of another cell, all those biomacromolecules um, that need to self-assemble into devices or organelles that form up the cell. It needs to take in, store, and use energy. Next, it of course needs to stay alive. And in order to stay alive, it needs to be able to adapt to its environment. It has to sense its environment. It has to sense its own internal state and change in response and communicate with other cells to overcome challenges from the environment, which may be stressors or nutrient starvation. And it has to adapt to that in order to stay alive. So, and then there are many cells that take on specialized tasks, particularly in multicellular organisms, for example, where there's some division of labor and develop specialized skills for unique environments. So an example of this may be a neuron in your brain or a pancreatic beta cell whose big job it is to sense glucose and make insulin in response to benefit the rest of the body in the multicellular organism, you in this case. So from our traditional biological framework, we organize and study these things in terms of metabolism, cell division and growth, gene expression, signaling, cell migration, mobility, DNA repair, cell-cell communication, paracrine signaling. But if we take now those same topics and view them through a machine framework, then we see really we're talking about energy storage manufacturing of biomolecules, for example, catalysis, pumping, moving ions and biomolecules around. To stay alive, the cell has to be a sensor and needs to be an actuator, a processor. Often it needs to keep time. It needs to have some sort of internal clock and function as a clock. And in multicellular organisms or in bacterial communities that um, communicate with different cells with one another, they need to function as an integrated system or network. So often we have studied these machine functions. We've sort of organized them traditionally into engineering disciplines, such as we're talking about thermodynamics, kinetics, transport, controls, networks, and informatics. And so in all of these cases, our framework and our disciplines may be very different, but we're talking about the same thing. And that's been one of the major goals of biological engineering over the last um, several decades, is to really merge these frameworks and have a, a, a more holistic framework for viewing the cells that allows us to consider the complex complexity of the biology, but also to be able to 
utilize existing and develop new engineering tools to turn cells into devices and to engineer and re-engineer cells. And so that's one of our goals today, is to sort of view the cell as a living machine and begin to create that, that holistic framework in your mind. So in viewing from this point of view now, we can consider sort of a minimal model of a bacteria such as E. coli. And at the most basic level, under sort of ideal lab conditions, a bacterial cell such as E. coli has sort of five really big functions or jobs that have to take place. It has to uh, bring in energy in the form of most often raw material, basically molecular food, and convert that energy into usable energy. We talked in our last lecture about ATP being really the energy currency of living cells. It has to take that usable energy in ATP to make ribosomes that can be used to make more ribosomes and all the proteins in the cell whose job it is to function in metabolism, all those enzymes, all the transporters that really are the workhorse of the cell and all of its function. So to make all these other proteins um, that are coded in the genome. And these proteins need to assemble to form new cells and participate in energy conversion. So by looking at these really five basic steps, we can view at a simple level, this really minimalistic model, essential functions of a bacteria under ideal conditions. And this brings us into a framework now that becomes more quantifiable and engineerable. So let's go back to our um, Merriam-Webster definition of a machine. So two things I've, I've highlighted in here uh, of particular importance, which we're going to look at today. So if we consider this definition, a machine is a piece of equipment with moving parts that does work when it's given power, right? So work and power, we're talking about energy and we're talking about thermodynamics here. Right. So let's take a little bit deeper look into what are the energy inputs of the cell? What form does it take in energy? How much? What's the power consumption of a cell? Um, and rate of that energy, in other words, the power consumption. And also, what work does a cell need to do? Right. So if it has to take in energy, store it, and then use that energy to do work, um, what types of work? What are the magnitudes of um, different types of work that a cell needs to, um, what, at what energy magnitude is required and at what rates? What's the, the power requirements for doing the work that a cell needs to do to live and function? So let's look at the cell, cellular energy and storage. So the two sort of big buckets of cellular uh, energy inputs, depending on the type of cell you're talking about, are sunlight and molecular food. And really, essentially, our molecular food, all the energy there, originally came from sunlight through cooperation of different organisms, right? But so these are our two main energy sources for life and cells on this planet. Now cells take in this energy and they convert it into forms that it can store and then it can use to do work. And the sort of major buckets of usable and storable energy, it can store energy as ATP, energy rich um, molecule as we've discussed earlier. It can also um, create, store and create usable uh, um, store usable energy as an electrochemical potential across membranes, either the cellular membrane or organelle membranes. In electron-rich molecules for uh, enabling reducing power in the cell, it can also store energy in stored polymers, such as starch here, are these starch storages, carbohydrate polymers in plant cells, in animal cells, glycogen is uh, another carbohydrate polymer that's used heavily for storage in animal cells. Lipids are another major class of uh, storage molecules. And so let's go a little bit, if 
If in our cells, sugars, for example, are one of the most common molecular foods, let's take a little bit closer look at that particular energy input. And so how does the cell access the energy stored in sugars? As I said, a primary molecular food for cells. And if we look at um, harnessing uh, that energy in those molecules via oxidation, if we were to look at the direct burning combustion of, of sugar uh, with oxygen, we can see first there's a very large activation energy that needs to be overcome. Um, by heat from a fire, for example, in order to burn that sugar and release the free energy that's available um, to do work. And that difference is about 3,000 uh, kilojoules per mole for oxidation of glucose. Now, a cell does this differently. In combustion, um, this free energy is, is mostly released in a form that is not storable and usable, and the cell now converts and captures some of this energy in activated carrier molecules by this series of enzymatic steps, many small steps, to get from this high energy to the low energy full oxidation of glucose. And this, this helps to reduce the activation energies. They become smaller, enabled. That's really a big job of what enzymes do. And in doing this, we are able to capture energy and store it in molecules such as um, ATP. And actually about, so in when you look at the, um, in glycolysis, for example, we usually get somewhere on a, the order of about 30 ATP molecules from the conversion of glucose um, all the way down complete oxidation to carbon dioxide and water. So let's ask the question, what's the rate of energy consumption or power consumption uh, via glucose in a cell? So we're going to look at one particular example. Let's look at the beta cell in your pancreas. So as I mentioned before, beta cells are the cells that it's their job to sense glucose and produce and release insulin in response. So these cells, as many cells do, have glucose transporters that take up the sugar glucose with some flux rate that we can measure in units of number of molecules per area per unit time. And here's some data from some beta cells in culture. Uh, and we can look at now the, and these are um, numbers that were measured here at Purdue and my group, and we, in these particular cells, if we measure the glucose flux at the surface of these particular beta cells in culture, we can see a very large glucose influx rate of about five micromoles per centimeter squared per second. And we can see that flux, we can reduce that flux by inhibiting this transporter, this protein molecule, and we can see that flux totally goes away if we poison the cell or kill the cell. So let's do a quick calculation of our measured flux, our very large, in this case, glucose flux of five micromole per centimeter squared per unit time, and consider now that free energy released by glucose oxidation, which is about 3,000 kilojoules per mole. We do some unit conversions and look at this power consumption per surface area of the beta cell is pretty big in this calculation, about 15 watts per cubic centimeter. So if we now think about this to convert this on a per cell basis and consider the approximate surface area of a beta cell, which is about 1,600 square microns, and we can do our unit conversion, we get on the order of about 10 to the minus 4 watts per beta cell, which is, again, a very a pretty large number for cells, as we'll see. And I, I will point out here that this, as I've mentioned, is a particularly large glucose flux. For most cells that we measure, the glucose flux is more on the order of um, 10 to 100 picomoles per centimeter squared per second. And so the case of these cells is sort of interesting. It's sort of interesting to look at the extreme case as these cells are. So as I mentioned before, so we're talking, we've been talking about doing some calculations of glucose input and in thinking in terms of glucose. And it's really the job of 
um, primary metabolism to convert molecular food, such as glucose and other sugars, into ATP and reducing power. So as I mentioned, generally, so this process of glycolysis and the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, through complete conversion of a glucose molecule, we can get depending on the conditions of the cell and the metabolic state, anywhere from 20 to 36 ATPs generated per glucose molecule. And if we look at the free energy change, we talked before about glucose oxidation is about 3000 kilojoules per mole glucose. If we look at the, the complete ATP hydrolysis from ATP to ADP, so in other words, releasing the free energy that's in that high phosphate bond in ATP, we can get, depending on the conditions of the cell again, but under physiological conditions, about 50 to 70 kilojoules per mole. So again, this brings us to, we've been mostly talking about ATP as usable energy in the cell, as we just mentioned that high energy phosphate bond, where the energy can be released, that 50 to 70 kilojoules per mole via hydrolysis of that phosphate bond, converting ATP to ADP. There are other forms of usable energy that the cell uses, and that is in the buildup of these electrochemical potentials, this storage. Remember that the cell membrane um, is basically a capacitor, right? And it can store charge in ions such as sodium and potassium and chloride and calcium across these membrane capacitors to store charge and to store electrochemical potential that can later be used by the cell to do work. We also, through metabolism, generate high electron uh, dense molecules such as NADP that give the cell reducing power. And these together are sort of the three major um, currencies of energy that's able to do work um, in the cell. So we'll mention too, we talked about energy storage, often for longer term storage. And, and cells can store energy in polymers, as we mentioned, such as starches and um, glycogen. So animal cells will commonly store glycogen, like us, we're, we're animals. Um, we store glycogen in our cells. Plant cells will commonly store starch in cells. And other cells can also store, as this paramecium um, and amoeboids will store lipid um, compartments as well for energy storage. And if we do a quick calculation and think about the glycogen storage in a very, in a just typical average human, will be on the order of somewhere 200, 400, uh, 500, we'll call it 350 here, grams of glycogen per human being, okay? And now if we look at how much energy is stored in glycogen, and we'll do this by mass now, because remember these polymers can have variable molecular weight. So we'll think about them rather in terms of moles, but in terms of grams. And a hu and, um, and in this case, there's about 4.2 kilojoules per gram um, free energy available in glycogen. And so if we do this conversion, now a human such as you and I may have about 1500 kilojoules um, of energy stored in glycogen that's available to be released, free energy release from those molecules in a, in a typical human. Okay, so let's look at power consumption from a different point of view now. And now here's a calculation that was done uh, considering oxygen consumption rates in a single bacterial cell. So what they did here now was to take the oxygen consumption rate, much like we looked at um, the glucose consumption rate in our beta cells before. Now, if we sort of measure that input in terms of oxygen utilization, that is um, used in aerobic metabolism. And that's a measurable number, just like our glucose flux was. And here's a, a, a common or a measured number for oxygen consumption in our uh, bacteria under particular conditions of about 30 millimoles of oxygen per gram dry weight uh, per hour. Okay, so the cell dry weight or CDW. And we can, if we consider the free energy change in oxidative uh, cellular respiration, 
is about 500 kilojoules per mole um, oxygen. So now we can take those numbers, look at our oxygen consumption rate, our free energy release, do some unit conversion, and we'll convert from dry mass, and remember some of the numbers that we looked at, dry mass versus wet mass of bacteria in our previous lecture, and we can convert a typical dry mass into a wet mass now here, and we get to a final number of about 10 to the minus 12 watts per cell, or about, if we look at this in terms of mass, about a thousand watts per kilogram. So thinking about this in a context we may be familiar with then, if we think of a hundred watt light bulb, now a kilogram of E. coli is about equivalent to 10 light bulbs. So this gives us some sense of what energy scale range we're, we're, and power consumption we're talking about here. Now, just a few notes to remind you here. Again, all of these are really ballpark estimates to give a sense of scale and to help you build some intuition about orders of magnitude. And they're based on general standard conditions. And so these numbers are likely to vary quite widely depending on the cell state, the metabolic state, if it shifts, if it's in a starvation mode, if it's in, uh, if our bacteria is in exponential phase and rapidly dividing. Um, its environment, the type of cell and what's, what it's doing. Our beta cells we looked at before have very high energy demands because of all that insulin they need to make and, 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 uh, and pump out as well as moving a lot of ions around uh, in order to do that. And so a challenge still remains. It's still very difficult in a lot of cells to really directly measure power consumption in our individual cells. So that's sort of something to think about as you think towards the future is how we get more um, specific and quantitative for specific systems um, in measuring power consumption and energy conversion and utilization in cells, which will become very important as we begin to um, engineer cells for more commercial and practical uh, purposes. So coming up now, we're gonna take a closer look at cellular work of the cell, looking at the power consumption of cell motility as an example, both actin mediated and flagellar motor mediated. We'll also look at cellular pumps, the type of work that cells need to do. And from this really sort of contemplate a thermodynamic view of life or at least death. Hope to see you next time.